Hi, my name is Eric Becker. I'm a technical solutions architect at Worldwide Technology. Uh, most of my focus is cloud data management and infrastructure automation. And I'm here to talk to you today about NetApp Disaster Recovery as a Service. And this capability came about uh, from frequent requests from customers that needed a uh, disaster recovery solution um, that really focused on the, the minimum time to fail over, losing the least amount of data in terms of the gap between that last backup and uh, when they actually had to fail over. And that's really where you know, NetApp SnapMirror technology comes into play and where it's, it's really powerful. So using something like SnapMirror, you can do synchronous or asynchronous replications. Um, in a synchronous replication, obviously, you're getting you know, real-time or near-real-time data transferred to both your primary site and your disaster recovery site. And with asynchronous, you, know, you can define whatever type of interval you want to, s to replicate that data. Uh, what we've chosen in this demo is you know, a five second in or five minute interval on replicating data between the two sites, which means in any type of disaster situation, the maximum amount of time from the last backup that we're actually utilizing data at the recovery side is gonna be five minutes, so anywhere from zero to five minutes. Um, and really what this is focused on is those uh, customers that are running enterprise applications that can't rely on simply last night's backup or a backup from the day before that as well. Um, and also, it adds a lot of other benefits in terms of being able to not only replicate that data and fail over to the disaster side, but also fail it back with that data and just transfer back the deltas. So what we focused in this architecture is this overview here. So on the left-hand side, it's really showing the ATC. This would be the customer's on-prem data center. And the application that we actually have in this demo is a traditional you know, web server or the SQL server backend. Web server here is, is basically a custom built web app that's meant to show seismic data. We can get into that in a few minutes here. And then on the other side, the, the back end, we're running Microsoft SQL Server, and it's a very traditional architecture, you know, 20, Windows 2016, and um, we're backing both of those by a NetApp all flash fast. And we're using, um, on the on-prem side, this shows this LUN, this is Fiber Channel on-prem. Uh, we'll, we'll show a similar architecture out here, out in Equinix and Azure that's actually using iSCSI, but again, we're using file access between um, that SQL server and the storage backend. And again, you know, like we said before, you know, we chose SnapMirror for a lot of the other benefits we discussed. NetApp ONTAP gives us some additional functionality in terms of you know, data efficiencies, data services, file and block access, and then also because we're using SnapMirror, that means it doesn't necessarily need to be NetApp on tap. We could be using other NetApp technologies in here, like you know, SolidFire, and there's integrations with um, other NetApp technologies that use SnapMirror without requiring any type of um, third service, third party service, or another piece of software that needs to be installed by NetApp. This all runs natively on the controllers themselves. We wanted to give customers the ability to have to maintain data sovereignty. So when they're replicating their data from on-site onto a co-location facility here, they're actually able to maintain ownership of all that data. So there's no issues with compliance or security. They own the data. Um, you know, it can be encrypted if they so choose. And then also, we're leveraging compute out in Azure. So we have VMs that are powered off out in Azure. And what that affords us is the ability to not require, we're not required to have compute sitting idly out in Equinix, right? We have these VMs that are powered off, they're not incurring the same charges that you would for having them run all the time. At any type of disaster situation, we can practically turn those VMs on after we've synchronized the last bits of data, assuming the site's still available. If it's not available, we'll just take the last available backup that was done, power the VMs up, they'll access that data, and then you're only incurring those charges so long as you're in that disaster situation. Once you've uh, once that disaster is finished, once you've actually gotten your, your primary site back up, whatever may have happened, you can then fail that data back. And that, again, that's a very important piece that customers forget a lot of times is getting that service running back on site. And that's not only getting the services, the orchestration of all the services up and running, but also getting the data back. So, you know, what does that look like from other services in terms of are you going to get, you know, large egress fees because you're going to have to transfer all the data back? How much time is that going to take? And you know, in this case, we're just getting the, the deltas from when we've been running that disaster scenario. So any of the new blocks that have changed out there will then be replicated back as we snap mirror that data back on site, and then we can get it up and running again. And then the other piece that we were kind of uh, talking about here is the orchestration of the entire environment. So we chose Ansible Tower 
Um, Ansible has a lot of integrations with NetApp on tap. NetApp's really done a great job of writing um, quite a bit of a lot of modules uh, for on tap as well as SolidFire and a lot of the other solutions. And this makes it very easy to integrate with not only this type of disaster scenario, but your entire infrastructure, whether that's you know IP management, networking, other compute, whatever it may be. You know, Ansible and Ansible Tower really gives you that enterprise grade automation that we can orchestrate the failover and fail back of this environment. And lastly, what we're talking about here is, you know, not only do we choose Equinix just because of all the co-location facilities that they have. They have over 180 different data centers, over five different countries, but they also have a lot of options in terms of um, direct connections into the major uh, public cloud providers. In this case, we're using um, ExpressRoute to get into uh, Azure. And what that affords us is a sub two millisecond latency consistently, you know, over the entire you know, duration of that application running. So it's not only a very low latency uh, connection, there's low jitter and there's uh, high resiliency. We're not seeing a lot of drop packets or anything like that. So let's get a little bit more into the demo itself, you know, what this looks like and, and how this can benefit you. So this is a little bit more over um, what our application is going to look like. I just did a filler before, so what I'm going to do is refresh this site on the primary side. So everything on the left pane is our on-prem data center. Everything in the right pane over here is going to be a combination of Equinix and Azure, and I'll show you more here. So if we refresh the application on the right-hand side, this is our custom application. It's going to time out here eventually, but it's basically showing that the database in uh, Azure is down. It's accessing, again, that data out in uh, Equinix. And um, so one site's going to be up at any given time. And on-prem here, these are the VMs that we're really working with. So we've got this MySQL server running as a VM, you know, if you have a traditional vSphere environment today, as well as Docker. That's what our web application is running on um, right now. And then if we look out here at Azure, we have a similar scenario where we have this MySQL server here and this Docker server as well. And you know the MySQL server is powered off out here, so he's ready to start whenever we need to start him up. And what that's going to look like in terms of the failover itself, you know, this is Ansible Tower. Again, that's going to give us that enterprise grade automation that we need for uh, failing a site, you know, back over out into Azure and Equinix as well as fail it back. And there's a couple simple playbooks that we wrote in order to facilitate all this. And what it's really going to go through is, you know, it's going to start off and we're going to uh, basically um, power off our server back here on um, our primary site. We're going to do one last snap to see if we can actually get the last little bits of data, assuming that the site hasn't actually hard failed. And then we're going to cut over to the other side. So we'll start off with this uh, template right here, ATC to Equinix Azure failover. We're going to go ahead and launch this. And what it's going to do in the background, it's going to go ahead and synchronize this template with any new data that might be out in Git. So it's going to get the newest copy of this playbook. It's going to go ahead and start running it. As we're running through this playbook, you can see, you know, anything in yellow here is basically anything that's changed. Um, anything that comes in is in red is going to be something that failed. Anything that comes in is green is going to be something that didn't need to change, right? And that's anything that comes in green is typically something that's going to be called, you know, item potent, meaning that we can run the same playbook again and again and it only changes what it needs to. So the items that don't need to be changed are just going to come in in green. So what we did first was, you know, we shut down the SQL server on-prem, that's the ATC, and we break our snap mirror relationship, and then we actually uh, begin the failover itself. So what's going on right now is we're powering on the Azure SQL instance. And we take a look at that. So right now it's sitting here waiting to start. If I refresh it again, the start button's grayed out because this VM is powering on right now. And, you know, in all it's going to take a minute or two, if there was a um, more critical for the failover to happen faster, this failover is going to take anywhere from like a minute and a half to two minutes, um, we could leave these running all the time and you wouldn't actually have to incur that extra minute or so for the VM to power on. Come back and look at him. Now while that's running, we can go ahead and actually look at the NetApp controllers back here. So again, the left hand side is the ATC. And we're going to show one issue because we're breaking that snap mirror relationship. If I go ahead and look at the volume itself, it 
a little bit more data here. So he's still showing his read write over here, but it's broken. And then on the Azure side, what we'll see is the same volume, DB1 data. And he's showing read write now as well. Before he was showing as DP for data protection, but since we're doing that failover, he's now uh, writable. Outside of that, what will happen is, you know, when we fail back, I'll show you this again, but that volume will actually go back into data protection mode. That means that the uh, SQL Server, if it were to remain running all the time out in Azure, it would just see a read-only database, or read-only uh, one that's being presented out. So here we go, we just came back, and the rest of this playbook just finished. So um, here, are these last little pieces are just waiting for that VM to power up. So in all, that took about two minutes. And again, we could probably could have cut that in half or less if we would just have the VMs running all the time. But you know, the important thing here is that we didn't want to incur any charges as a simple DR, DR scenario. Uh, if you had higher criticality, we'd just leave that running all the time. So if we refresh this side, both of them. This may take a few minutes for this to come up, so we'll kind of wait here for a second. What we'll eventually see is these errors will go away. And then this takes up to 30 seconds, and that's just built into the web application itself. It'll take about 30 seconds or so to figure out that it can't cache the data and it can't connect to the database. There it is. So we refreshed, and now we've got on the um, Azure side, Azure Equinix uh, configuration that we have here. Um, the Azure VM is now running live. This side's still spinning. He will eventually time out and we'll see a database error. So we'll just kind of give it a minute here, let everything kind of um, time out here to make sure that everything's in a good state before we continue. Um, the nice thing here is that we can easily see what's running where because every single one of these VMs either has an ATC you know, an Azure or an EQX prefix to indicate exactly where it's running. Um, and this is ex expected. We see that the on-prem side is now getting an operational error. You know, additionally, we could have just hard powered off these VMs to showcase the same type of situation just to prove that it went down hard. But um, this is just a little bit quicker in terms of showcasing the demo. All right, so now we've got the site basically in a DR situation. All the data is uh, failed over. Our workload has failed over. Um, the relationship between the two controllers is still showing as broken here. So if I click on this DB1 data volume that was replicated, we'll show this one issue here. Yeah, he's basically showing the relationship is broken off. And the same thing here with DB data one here on the Equinix side. Now this guy's running live with all of our production data right now. He's still showing the same type of issue with the relationship that's broken off between the two sites. So now what we'll do is we'll qu quickly fail this back over, back from our disaster side, disaster recovery scenario, back to uh, bringing everything back to our primary data center. In order to do that, we just go back to our dashboard here in Ansible Tower, and we're gonna run a slightly different playbook. So now we're gonna go from, instead of ATC to Equinix. We're going to go from Equinix to the ATC. And this is essentially going to run through the same scenario again. And one of the things I kind of wanted to touch on here is what really allows this to happen in this scenario is this low latency connection. Because like I said, we're simply accessing um, the volume and LUNs over here from Azure to Equinix, there's, you know, like I said, a sub two millisecond latency and what that's gonna look like in terms of real time, you know, this is just a graph showcasing what the latency is real time. And we see the, the yellow line here is showing over the past hour, the latency from our web server um, back to Equinix, or so our web server running out in Azure back to our uh, Equinix server, our Equinix uh, gateway, and we're showing at any point in time, as I scroll over, you can see, kind of follow my mouse, it's anywhere from you know, 1.5 to 2 milliseconds of latency. And that's just from the past hour. We can go back at any time here and see that it's been really flat 
over that past 24 hour period and we can even go a little bit further back than that we can go s to the past say seven days right we might have a few blips here that kind of bumped up a little bit above two milliseconds but it's still very low and then the green line is just showcasing our connection from our on-prem data center out into equinix um, and you see that's a little bit higher of a latency um, and that's just due to the type of connection that we chose when we connected that up from our on-prem data center Right, let's go back and check on the failover scenario. So we went essentially through the reverse of the exact same thing. We went from Equinix, we power off our Azure SQL instance because we no longer want it running. Um, and then we're gonna basically bring everything back online at the ATC. So, so we come back to our actual application here. What we're gonna see is a little bit healthier of a status on our protection here between the two sites, the volumes that are being replicated. This one will come back in a little bit here, but we'll go back and look at this application. Oops. All right, so now our web application is back live and running um, on-prem. And then this guy is eventually going to time out in the uh, our Equinix Azure disaster recovery side. And that pretty much is it. Um, in terms of viewing this or any other demos in the ATC, you know, please be sure and hit our website. Uh, for this specific demo, if you want more information, um, you can just you know, hit our website, go out to infrastructure and cloud data management. There will be a, a NetApp disaster recovery as a service capability out there. Um, and you get a lot more information as well as you know, other types of capabilities around cloud data management, automation, storage, uh, and a lot of other topics. Thank you.